Hello, church. Welcome. Welcome to all of you joining us online as well. We are glad you're here. Welcome to Pentecost. Um, I know some of you are wearing red. Thank you. Uh, I did not tint my face red for Pentecost. That's I've been sitting out on metal bleachers all day at a track meet. That's why my face is this color. Uh, before we get into Pentecost, though, um, just a word about uh, COVID restrictions. You know, we had a meeting Monday night, our Discipleship Vision Board. And we, went, we went around and around on this one. And we have decided to extend our restrictions just for a little while longer, five or six more weeks. And a reason for doing that is there's a number of reasons that we recognize that there are strong feelings on both sides of this. Um, but we, you know, in Minnesota as a state is getting around 70% vaccination. But Anoka County, where we live, is not. We, Anoka County is lagging behind at about 50%. And we have, uh, while Hennepin County is four times as big as Anoka County, we, we have half as many COVID cases still as they do. So we just, we want to show an abundance of caution and just do what is best for, for our neighbor and for all the members of St. Matthew. And, you know, I, again, I recognize their strong feelings. I've heard some of those strong feelings this week, but feel free to share your, your input. We've got some DVB members here tonight in Carrie and Larry and myself. Uh, you know, feel free to, to give your input to, to any of us. Pentecost Day, a day when the church, is, we, we recognize that the church is both united and diverse. And it is that unity and that diversity that makes us beautiful. Let's begin with prayer. And Father, we are all one in Christ. And yet we are all different. And if we look around the church at large, we see there's more differences than we could ever list, you know, culturally, uh, um, race differences, tradition differences, theological differences, and, and yet, Lord, we are all one in Christ. You, you poured out your Holy Spirit on all of us, and we gather today, Lord, as part of the worldwide church, the universal church throughout the ages to worship you. So be with us, Lord, and let allow us, empower us to respond to you in worship. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our worship begins the way our lives in Christ begin in baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't these all who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. I will show you wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, ignite within us a fiery passion for your mission in the world today. Warm us by the Spirit's dancing tongues of flame, that we may feel your kindling blaze within, urging us to do your greater good. Make us wholly present to experience a new birth and awaken possibilities within us to share your love in the world. In this love and abundance, we come to celebrate your harvest, a harvest bearing the first fruits of the Spirit within us. Show us how to use these gifts as we listen for your truth in the rushing winds and gentle breezes of your Spirit. Amen. We take this time to greet each other.
God's peace. God's peace. Hello. Today I want to talk to you about helpers. You know what a helper is. You are probably a helper. Are you a helper at home? Do you help set the table? Do you help dust? Do you help feed the dog or other animals? You are a helper at home. Are you a helper at school? Do you help pick up extra pencils and papers? Do you help somebody who's having trouble? You know what a helper is, right? Yes, and I'm sure you are all helping in some way or another. In our Bible lesson today, Jesus was going into heaven. This is actually a Bible lesson last week, but he was about to leave and ascend back into heaven, and he said, I am going back into heaven, but I will send a helper to you. And in the lesson we just heard, the helper came. They knew the helper came when they heard the sound of a great and mighty rushing wind. They knew the helper had come when the tongues of fire were on the apostles, the disciples' heads. They knew the Holy Spirit had come when Peter boldly stood up and told the people about Jesus and that they needed to say they were sorry for their sins. The Holy Spirit came. Now, they didn't see the Holy Spirit, but they knew he was there. The Holy Spirit comes with us, too. Just like we know wind is there, we can't see it, but we can see what it does, and we can feel it on us, okay? The Holy Spirit helper is here even when we can't see it. We can see what he does. Or the Holy Spirit can't talk to us like mommy and daddy do, but he does talk to us in his word. When we hear Bible stories being read to us, when we hear them being told to us, we're hearing God's word like Peter spoke to the people. The Holy Spirit is with us too. Or maybe this one. Holy Spirit is with us and helps build faith muscles when we talk to him, when we listen for him. The Holy Spirit is with us. Let's pray our thanksgiving for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Dear Jesus, thank you for the Holy Spirit helper who is with me, who helps me to understand and who strengthens my faith muscles. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson is from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in, a, in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord, Lord says, come, breathe from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord. Please rise as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapters 15 and 16. Glory to you, o Lord. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you, will, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus. Amen. There is a true beauty to unity. You know, if, if you've seen or heard a choir that's just completely united or you've seen a marching band doing their thing in perfect unity, there is a true beauty to that. And there's also a true beauty to diversity. You know, if you take a, a trumpets and and violins and percussion and flutes and piccolos and clarinets and tubas and if they can all perform together those diverse sounds make something beautiful there's a beauty to unity there's a beauty to diversity and i can't think of a better of anywhere on earth with more potential to show the true beauty beauty of unity and the true beauty of diversity than in the church from, and I can't think of a better time to celebrate the unity and diversity of the church than on Pentecost Day. You know, we, we, we know that in the church, we can look around, we don't even have to look throughout the nation, we can just look around our own neighborhood, we recognize that there are differences between Christians. And we, we, if we started to make a list, we'd be here till sometime next year. The, the, the differences between Christians are, you can't count them. And yet, we, we are all one, and that uniqueness that we each bring to the body of Christ makes this beautiful mosaic that we call the church. In St. Louis, Missouri, there's a cathedral called the St. Louis Cathedral, and on one of their walls, the whole wall is a big mosaic. That's pieces of glass and rock and tile put together to make a picture. And if you stand back 100 feet or so and look at it, it's beautiful. But if you get up close, you see the smudges and the cracks and the dirt and the imperfections, and you can't really see the picture at all. To me, that, that's the church. That's the church. We are. We take all of our differences, put them together in a mosaic, and we make something beautiful. The church is meant to be united, and the church is meant to be diverse. You know, sadly, throughout the centuries, these, di these diverse parts of us have become divisions. You know, I, you know, I find it ironic that Jesus said, I am the way, and we take the way, and we often turn it into the wall to cause a division between us and someone else. And, and we very much you know, become a, a culture of us, them, and the other, whoever other is, is to be feared and not to be trusted. And that hurts, that hurts the church, that hurts the unity and the beauty of the church. And you would have think we'd gotten better at it. You know, we've been doing this for over 20, for about 21 centuries. But you look at us now, and it's like history, not just history repeating itself. We're getting worse at this. And so Pentecost, Pentecost becomes this moment of grace for us when God's spirit is poured out on all people and God's grace is poured out on all people. A little bit of history to help us understand this. Pentecost is a Jewish festival. Long before it was a Christian festival, it was a Jewish festival that was part of the spring harvest. And Jews, for, Jews from all over the world would come. But how did Jews get all over the world? Well, if we go back to the 
to the different invasions of Israel under the, the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians, the, the Jews spread out. They went to, you know, to, to Eastern Europe, to North Africa, and the Middle East. They just spread out, and they took their Judaism with them, and so there were converts to Judaism, and the, the Jews and the converts to Judaism would come from all these different countries to celebrate Pentecost. And within the Jewish church, just as within the Christian church, there were differences. You know, we, we read in the Bible about Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots and Herodians and Essenes. These were all different sects or denominations within Judaism, and all of them felt like they had the right idea about what was best for the people of God, and they all felt like they had the right idea of what it meant to be the people of God, and they're all there, and when Peter stands up to preach, God's grace is poured out on literally thousands of them without without regard for what culture they came from or what their religious tradition was or what their skin color was or anything else. There, it was poured out on all of them. So we see right there from the, from the moment of Pentecost that the church is meant to be diverse. And these aliens who had come to Jerusalem for the Pentecost festival, they went back to their countries and they went back having been converted and spreading the message of Christianity so that this young faith spread like wildfire through that part of the world. From its inception, the church is meant to be diverse. There's a variety of cultures, a variety of languages, a variety of nations, and it's on Pentecost Day when they're all, all there gathered, all this diversity is in one place, that's where God chooses to pour out his spirit. And these, this would go on, these people would go on to change the world forever. The message of Christ hasn't changed one little bit since Pentecost Day. And there are still a lot of similarities between us and the first century church, and there's a lot of differences. One of, one of the big differences I see is in our passion. You know, in that early church, there, there was a passion. Nothing was going to stop them from spreading the good news about Jesus. We lack that passion most of the time. One of the similarities I see, I see is that they were immediately troubled by these cultural differences. It doesn't show up in Acts 2, but by the time we get to Acts 4, 5, and 6, we see it because we've got Jewish Jews from Israel, and we've got Greek Jews coming from other parts of the world, and the Greek, the, I mean, Greek, new Greek Christians and the Greek Christians are complaining because they don't feel like their widows are getting the same share of food that the Jewish, widow, Jewish Christian widows are getting. And so they have to start dealing with these differences right off the bat. And then they have to answer questions like circumcision. You know, what role is circumcision going to play in this new faith? Are people going to have to become Jewish before they become Christian? And they, they don't deal with these issues very well in the same way that we don't deal with these cultural differences today very well. We have a lot of room to grow, as did the early church. But it starts by recognizing that God's Spirit is poured out on everyone. You know, in the kingdom of God, there are no illegal aliens. If we're in the kingdom of God, we're here legally. And there are no undocumented workers in the kingdom of God. We are, if we're baptized, we're all documented. Our names are written in the book of life. And, and, there, and the, 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 the biblical writers would say, they would say this by saying there's no slave, no free, no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female. We're all one in Christ. The Holy Spirit's poured out freely, without respect to any kind of citizenship or social economic class. You know, how did, how did Joel put it? In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The Holy Spirit's poured out on all of us. And that Holy Spirit works to transform us. The Holy Spirit becomes God's transforming agent. There's a, a church father, a fourth century theologian named Basil, who would go on to become Saint Basil, and I found this brief little paragraph that he wrote about the Holy Spirit. It says, through the Holy Spirit, we are restored to paradise, led back to the kingdom of heaven, 
adopted as God's children, given confidence to call God Father, to share in Christ's grace, to be called children of light, and to be given a share in eternal glory. There's a whole seven-point sermon I could preach there. I want, but he, he, all of this comes from the fact that God has poured out his spirit on us. And in order for all of this transformation to take place, in order for these, all of this great stuff to happen to us, all that we have to do is get out of the way. So this is what Jesus had been preparing his disciples for when he said, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We have to get rid of that self part. Just get rid of that, that center that is in self. And just let our center be in God, which is the natural work of the Holy Spirit when we don't get in the way. You know, Jesus had promised his disciples before he left, Brenda mentioned this in the children's sermon, last week's lesson, he'd promised that he would send the Holy Spirit. But he didn't, and he went into some detail about what the Holy Spirit would do. And then Paul, in his writings, will go into greater detail and say, what the Holy Spirit's going to do in you is he's going to produce fruit. Fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are nine qualities of Jesus that the Holy Spirit produces in us. And the only thing that, get, that messes up this plan is that God uses us. You know, I've said this before. If I were God, I would not have done it that way. You know, I, I, and I equate it to when my kids were little. Um, they would always want to help me in whatever I was doing. And if I was carrying the groceries, they wanted to help. That would mean I'd have to go through all the groceries and make sure there's no glass jars in the bags that they're carrying and then be prepared that it's going to take two or three times as long. And then when they got big enough to you know, reach the top of the lawnmower, they wanted to help cut the grass. And that meant taking two or three times as long to cut the grass. And we take them down to the farm and they wanted to help grandpa feed the cattle. And so instead of carrying big bushels around, they had to have these little paint buckets and made feeding the cattle take a whole lot longer. Well, we'll apply that to, to the kingdom of God. You know, if God did this work without us, he could do it a whole lot more efficiently and a whole lot faster, but he's chosen to do it with us. He's, he's given every one of us the Holy Spirit, and he's called every one of us in one way or another into mission. And one of the chief ways that we carry out this mission, and we've heard this again and again, is by loving one another. And that's hard. In some cases, it's impossible for us. And so that's why we have the Holy Spirit helping us do this. There's a story I heard about a man, self-made man, very successful man, but that also made him very egotistical. He was a Christian, and he'd gone to his pastor and explained, I just have trouble loving, learning how to love the least. And his pastor said, you'll be able to serve them when you see the crucified Christ in every person you meet, regardless of their social standing. That's a tough one. Every person you see, someone Jesus looks at and is willing to go to the cross for. And we have to learn to see them with those eyes. And the Holy Spirit is the one who opens our eyes so that we can see if we don't let ourselves get in the way. You know, there, there's a wonderful unity to us. Have you ever thought about the fact that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, we are doing that as one? Paul calls us one loaf when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And it's the Lord's Supper that makes us one. I know there's a, a, lot, of, a lot of different approaches to this in the Missouri Synod. We take, do we take the Lord's Supper because we are one or are we one because we take the Lord's Supper? And the way I read Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, in 10, 11, 12, is he says, we're, we are one loaf because we all participate in the Lord's Supper together. We all partake of the one body. We celebrate that oneness. So it's communion. It's, it's not just communion between us and God. It's communion between us and each other. It makes us one. And then think about the way baptisms are carried out in our church. You know, when we, when we baptize a child, we, we ask the parents and the sponsors a question, and then we turn to the congregation, and we give the congregation a, a, a responsibility because in the body of Christ, we are all one. 
So just as the Holy Spirit was poured out on everybody at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit continues to be poured out. And, you know, we are we're very blessed here at St. Matthew that we share this space with people from Sudan, people from Liberia, people from Ecuador. That, that diversity makes us beautiful. And the Holy Spirit continues to be poured out on all people. Right here in our building, it happens. On di different races, different cultures, different people. We're able to welcome people with differences into our midst and love them because in Christ we are one. And as we do that, we are reflecting the image of Christ. Well, let me close with a, with a, pe a Peanuts cartoon story. Uh, Linus was watching TV, and Lucy marches into the room and changes the TV channel. And Linus says, what makes you think you can walk right in here and take over? And Lucy says, these five fingers. <laughs> Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this, they become a mighty force. Linus says, go ahead and change the channel. Then he, looked, he looks at his fingers and says, why can't you guys get organized like that? Get ready, church. Get ready for the gift of the Holy Spirit given at Pentecost to renew us, to stir us up, to unite us, to take our individual differences and our uniqueness and make us beautiful and then make us a force to be reckoned with. Get ready, church. Amen and amen. Let's stand up and sing about it.
people of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead <coughs> in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Rachel Weiss would like prayers of thanksgiving. She was able to return home from uh, interlude this week. She's back in her own home. Wayne Bierkin is in rehab at um, Benedictine Center in New Brighton. Clint Gunderman, that's my father-in-law, Brenda's dad, is having a heart procedure on Tuesday. We would, and we would appreciate your prayers for that. I'm going to be going down uh, tomorrow night just to pretend I'm a farmer and take care of the farm chores for, uh, for the week while he is in the hospital. And then um, Deb Santillo would like prayers. Her sister Sharon, many of you know, um, her, her heart stopped twice this week at her home and then in her ambulance, and she had to be resuscitated twice. And because of that, she has some broken ribs and some pain, but uh, heart-wise, ev everything is working fine now, and she was, her life was basically saved by a, a visitor in her home that was in her, on the phone, okay that was able to call someone and talk them through CPR for 11 minutes until the ambulance got there. So let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. We are powerless to do so many of the things you call us to do. We are powerful to lead fruitful lives, powerless to lead fruitful lives. We are powerless to love our neighbor the way you call us to. We're powerless to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, just thank you for the Holy Spirit empowering us and compelling us to be the people of God and do the things that the people of God do. Make us aware, Lord, of the Holy Spirit and teach us not to get in his way. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who await your healing, for Rachel and Wayne and Glenn and Sharon and those we name in our hearts. Father, we pray that you would restore these to lives of health and lives of service to you, and we ask that according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those confined to their homes and nursing homes. Ruby Cool, the Bone of Mine Heart, Mary Von Bargen, Lester Rudd, comfort them with your presence, assure them of your love, fill their lives with hope. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for other churches in our community. Today, we pray for Hope Community Church and Pastor Drew, we pray that you bless them as people and pastor and pour out your spirit upon them and let them walk in the spirit. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our own church, Father. We pray that we too would walk in the spirit. As we do walk in the spirit, we produce the fruits of the spirit and be a people known by love who live by faith and who are a voice of hope. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for our community, our nation, our world. Lord, bless our elected leaders with all that they need to govern in the way that you want them to govern. Through your church and through the government, Lord, take away the burdens of poverty and homelessness and hunger, the burdens of racism and greed and hatred and war and terrorism. Work through us, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. We ask all these things knowing that you hear them, for we ask them in the name of Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Before we receive the gift of forgiveness from God's altar, let's confess our need for that forgiveness. Lord Jesus, we yearn for your presence. We, ser- we seek your abundant grace, yet we cannot feel it. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, we prepare to steer our souls for your purpose, yet we allow our common selves to intrude into the minds and your minds. Remind us, we pray, we pray that, that we only, only trust in the giver of life, life to, to find the hope and faith you have promised. promised. Gather us up in the winds of your favor and carry us to ever greater heights through Jesus Christ who loves us still. Amen. And hear the good news. God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake he forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of the word, it's my joy and privilege to stand in his stead and to speak the words he commands me to speak. All of your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God's people say, And we are now invited to celebrate that forgiveness in the Lord's Supper. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat the body of Christ. Take and drink the blood of Christ. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord Jesus strengthen you and preserve you in true faith to life everlasting. Serve the Lord in peace. Amen. I'll leave a time of silence for you to have your own prayer of thanksgiving. We do give you praise and thanksgiving, Almighty God, that you have come to us. You've made us one, and you've refreshed us and forgiven us and empowered us through the body and blood of Jesus. And we ask you, Lord, that you would continue to strengthen us, that we might do those things that we can only do by the power of the Holy Spirit. We love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Be in the Word this week. um, I'll send out an email on Monday for all of you that I have email addresses for. Starting a week from Monday, the uh, Memorial Day, we're going to start uh, reading through the book of Acts. We're going to take the whole summer to read through the book of Acts, and I've divided it up into daily readings. And then if you'd like, you can join us on Sunday morning when we have our Bible class. Um, Right now, that's all Zoom, but hopefully on July 11th, we will switch to, anybody who wants to join us on Zoom can, but we'll also be doing it in the Fellowship Hall at the same time. And we have now have technology to put the Zoom up on the screen in the Fellowship Hall and to hear the the voices coming from each direction. So we'd love to have you join us for that. Please rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God's people say.